item to the Governance and Audit Committee of Tuesday, the 9th of November. Um, there may be one or two members still um, with coming in to join us, but we'll make a start um, rather than delay any further. If you could have any apologies for absence, please. Thank you, Chair. I've had no apologies uh, given. Okay, thank you. Uh, on to agenda item two. Can we have any disclosures of interest, please? Yes, Chair, I, I have a personal interest in item four as a governor at Pentra Havard School. Thank you. Uh, Judy Davis? I've got a personal interest in item number five, community equipment stores and community alarms. I yeah, agenda item four, Chair, uh, governor at Pentra Havard School. Thank you. See any more hands up? Um, OK, if that's the case, then we move on to the minutes. I've just seen an apology from uh, Councillor Aaron Lloyd popping, uh, Councillor Clyde Lloyd popping up on the screen. Um, if we can move on to the minutes, then we take them for accuracy, first of all. Um, page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, are we happy that those minutes are an accurate recording of the meeting that's taken place on the 12th of October? If we can have a couple of hands up, just to support that, please. Yeah. I'll, I'll report you. that, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, just before we leave the minutes, just to say thank you to Jeremy for appending the scrutiny work plan as we asked at the last meeting to our, to our papers, and that would be a regular feature. Um, and if we move on then to agenda item four, which is the internal audit plan 21-22 monitoring report for July to September. This paper is for information, um, but Simon Cockings, the chief auditor, is on annual leave this week, and I'd like to welcome Nick, uh, the deputy, um, to, to present the paper for us. Please, Nick, can you give us a a summary of the, the key points that you wish us to note, but uh, acknowledging it's for information paper. Okay, okay thanks, Chair, and um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Nick Davis, the Principal Auditor, and subbing in for Simon today, who's off on a well deserved break. Um, I'm going to be presenting three reports, uh, the first being uh, agenda item number four, and that's on page six in the reports pack. Now, I am conscious that there's a lot to get through this afternoon, so uh, just to remind members really that, uh, as the Chair said, these reports are for information only, and therefore I'm just going to highlight the main points listed. So the first document is our quarterly two monitoring report, which covers the period the 1st of July to the 30th of September 21. And it shows the audits finalised during this period and any other work carried out by the team. So if we move down to point uh, on page, uh, the top of page seven, uh, point two, point one, uh, a total of 19 audits were finalised in the quarter. Uh, and they're all listed in appendix one, and that also gives the level of assurance. And in appendix two, uh, that also provides a summary of the scope of the reviews that we, we finalised during that period. So 2.2, uh, the 19 audits that were finalised, six had a high assurance, 11 a substantial assurance, and two were a moderate assurance. Uh, all in all, uh, 141 audit recommendations were made and management uh, agreed to accept 100% of those. Uh, 2.4 is just a breakdown of the of the risks of those recommendations. As you can see, three were high risk, uh, 23 medium, 82 low, and 33 good practice. On to 2.6, uh, the team also certified uh, the following grants during that period. Underneath, you can see the, the, the grants and the amounts uh, awarded. Uh, 2.7, just to uh, confirm that the committee can mon monitor the progress of our plan uh, at the start of the year. Uh, and Appendix 3 will show that uh, 
each audit included in the plan um, as at the 30th of September and where that audit is, i.e. whether it's been finalised or in progress or draft stage and so on. Uh, 2.10, just, just to confirm that, uh, you know, how the team has been working over the last uh, quarter, that we've, luckily, we've been able to undertake uh, a number of site visits now that um, some restrictions have been lifted, only where deemed to be essential, i.e. to the completion of the audit, but ongoing conditions do tend uh, still have a little bit of an impact on the uh, team's ability to progress some audits. Uh, as uh, business as usual. So we do uh, still, in the first instance, ask for uh, evidence to be provided remotely. 2.11, uh, again, Appendix 3 shows uh, our um, progress to the original plan uh, and confirms that 39 audit activities uh, had been completed, at least a draft stage, with an additional 31 audits in progress which uh, approximately results in about 53% of the plan has either been completed or uh, well underway. 2.12, uh, we issued two moderate reports during the quarter. And at the top of page nine, you can see it was the, uh, the community alarm service. Uh, and we've got a bit of a breakdown of what we've looked at and uh, a summary of the key points that we've identified during those reviews. And uh, on the following page, the community equipment service, again, with the scope of what we looked at and a summary of the key points that we, we picked up during the review. So I, I'm not gonna go into too much detail of these two reports because I know we've got officers uh, in uh, committee today that are gonna give us an update after uh, I present this agenda item so uh, they can give committee members an update. Um, on to section three, uh, follow-ups completed. We didn't complete any follow-ups in quarter two. We were going to look at uh, management absence. However, uh, committee had an update from the head of service in September. So uh, we are going to be uh, revisiting that now in quarter four. And finally, uh, at the top of page 12, just a bit of an update on the corporate fraud function update. Uh, I think one of the actions that came out of uh, a committee meeting in September is that the, the plan needed to be updated with some uh, uh, more realistic dates, if you like. So we, we've gone ahead and we've done that, and that's uh, in Appendix 4. So just moving quickly down to the appendices uh, on page, starting on page 14, uh, Appendix 1 shows the audit finalised, the audit finalised in that quarter. And um, you can see that listed the assurance levels and the number of recommendations. Uh, Appendix 2 uh, shows a summary of the scope of those audits that have been finalised during the quarter. Appendix 3 is our plan, audit plan that was agreed at the start of the year and the status as at the 30th of September. And you can see where each audit is at, at this current time. And then finally, as mentioned earlier, we have the uh, counter fraud action plan on Appendix 4, <clears throat> where we've updated some of the timescales um, as requested um, in September. So that's it for that agenda item, Chair. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I think it's, it's appropriate for us to wait to question, raise any questions or comments on the community alarm service and the community equipment service until officers present the update as agenda item five. But are there any other issues within that report? I can see Councillor Leslie Watton's hand up and then Julie Davis. So, yeah, Councillor Leslie Watton. I was going to make comments on it and after the next report, but just to say thank you for moving this item up the agenda, because I think item this is where it should be, because in my view, when each quarter this crops up, this is the one we should be looking at first. So thanks, whoever's um, rejigged the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, Jeremy helped us to, to achieve that request, so thank you. Um, Julie, Julie Davis. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, Nick, when there are repeated recommendations that were first uh, identified in previous reviews, is there any mechanism to increase the risk rating to to highlight the uh, the importance of uh, actually implementing the actions that have been recommended by audit and agreed by the service head? Uh, yes, thanks, Julie. Yeah, we do look at uh, re repeated recommendations and we, we do highlight them in the action plan and we do discuss them. It, it really depends um, on what the recommendation is. If, if we do feel we need to escalate it, say from a low risk to a medium risk, we, we will do that. And of course, then that can have an effect possibly on the overall assurance rate in the report. So yeah, they are discussed regularly. All depends really what the recommendation is. If it's a very sort of good practice type low risk, then we may not escalate it to the next level. However, if it is re repeated a number of times, yeah, we, we do look at maybe escalating that to the next level. Thank you. And I do have another question, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, a couple of uh, findings were in relation to GDPR recommendations. You've yeah. got a GDPR regulations cross cutting review on the audit plan. Will these findings be picked up? I'm, I'm specifically interested in the, the level one and level two assurance that's provided within the council. Yeah, I mean, we, we were asked to, to um, add these uh, these these questions and these these tests into each individual audit, which we have done. Uh, certainly over the last 12 months and yes when we, when we do meet now with the, the relevant officers for that cross-cutting audit that tier one cross-cutting audit yeah we, we'll certainly discuss the findings from uh previous audits you know if there are any issues with any parts of the um compliance with those gdpr tests then we can certainly uh you know pass that on to the management you know within that uh within that uh, review Thank you. I don't see any more hands up there. Nick, I, I've got a, a couple of questions or comments. Um, the one is in relation to the Glintrian Art Gallery. I notice in the appendix you talk about that a full valuation of assets was undertaken nine years ago in 2012. And I just wonder what your assessment of risk is associated with that, because it seems that. Uh, it would appear very large to me if we got assets that are, have not been revalued in you know for nine years. Uh, yeah, I think I think we have commented on it, Chair. And uh, again, I'd, I'd probably have to go back and, and look at the you know the individual report in more detail. But yeah, it has been highlighted, and I think we have discussed it with with the officers, the relevant officers. But um, yeah, once I get back and, and have a look at the actual report, I can certainly get back to you on that. Yeah. Ben, have you got a view on that? Yes, I accept your point, Chair, that it is on the, the long in the tooth side and it's probably been it stretched with, with COVID restrictions as well. I mean, um, from a, both verifying its complete existence, but also for up-to-date insurance matters, it is, it is right that it be uh, chivied along, shall we say. Except that there's a, a, a annual uh, valuation of new acquisitions, but I'm just thinking, you know, there's some valuable items in the Glenbury and Art Gallery that's been there for many, many years, and obviously with the increase in um, in, in value, I think uh, if that could be actioned um, sooner than than was planned, um, I think that would be helpful. Um, I'd also like to make reference to the counter fraud action plan. Um, and it's pleasing to see some movement to action all those recommendations. And I'm just wondering if one of the county forward officers could give us an update on this, the situation with the proactive work, because we did have concerns when we approved your plan, whether your resource would allow proactive work to be undertaken, which would be over and above the NFI work. Yeah, certainly, Chair. It's, it's Jeff Fisher. Do you want me to comment on that, or, or in the body of my report? I was going to bring that, bring, bring um, some matters to your that's attention. That's issue, then that would be helpful, I think. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I've not seen any more hands up, so if that's the case. This paper is for information. 
Um, so thank you, Nick, for presenting that paper. And I'm sure you'll be called in to comment as we get the response uh, at the next agenda item, which is agenda item five. And I'm not quite sure who's presenting this paper, which is the response to the community. Hi, Chair. Good afternoon. It's Helen St. John. I'm uh, Interim Head of Integrated Community Services for, for Swansea Council. And I've got Lucy Friday with me, who's the Principal Officer, who's currently responsible for the Community Equipment Store. We were going to um, share this item, if that's OK with you. That's fine. If you can go ahead, then, please. Thanks very much. Um, so just I was just going to give a little bit of context just around the community equipment store service generally and then Lucy who took over as principal officer with responsibility for the community equipment store in July of this year which I think was around the time the audit was carried out she is going to um, provide some further detail and some further context around um, the, the issues that have been raised particularly around the two high, high risk and the two uh, medium risk issues that the audit has raised. So the community equipment store, um, I'm, I'm sure majority of people will be familiar with it. Um, it's, it's a service that's a, a regional service for Neathport, Albert and Swansea and the health board. It's a tripartite arrangement and it's a, it's a store that provides uh, independent, supports people to live independently in the community. It supports prevention of admission to hospital and it supports, uh, it's, a, it's a key plank really in the support of hospital discharge for individuals who require um, technology or require uh, um, independence equipment to, to live safely and independently at home. Um, and as I'm sure you can imagine, the, 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 the focus over the last 20 months of the community equipment store has really been on supporting that flow out of hospital and they've, they've been a, a, a key sort of um, service in, in supporting the prevention of the NHS from being out overwhelmed during COVID and supporting people to return home promptly. Um, they deliver approximately 35,000 items, various items of equipment every year per annum, uh, varying from large pieces of equipment or big ticket items such as beds and hoists down to some, some fairly small and um, arguably single use pieces of equipment to support independent living in the community. And it's, it's around about a million pounds worth of equipment a year that, that's delivered. Um, in May 2019, I think it's important to add for context around this time period, um, the community equipment store also took over the, um, became the regional PPE distribution centre for the Welsh Government PPE stocks that were brought to the region for distribution within Swansea and Neath Port Talbot. And they were, um, well, they were hugely key in, in, in making sure that the PPE went out to the right places and was and was issued from there as a stock and as a, and a place that had the availability to store the, the level of PPE that was required. Um, so really, um, the focus of the service for the last 20 months has been very, very much around the emergency response and very, very much around the the um, the, the pandemic response really to continue delivering equipment out to individuals in their homes and also um, focusing on trying to make sure that we are picking up and returning and recycling equipment to go back into the system to be used again. Um, I just wanted to give some context really about the particular challenges that the service has had over the last um, 20 months just for context but I'm going to hand over to Lucy now really to provide a lot more detail around um, the issues that were raised during the audit report and to give you an update on the work to date and the future improvements that are planned to address the issues raised if i can lucy please thank you uh good afternoon everyone um so i, I won't go through the report word for word although it is quite brief um there is an appended um action plan for each of the areas as well which gives a full detail summary uh, update of each of the recommendations made through the audits that were completed um, so not wanting to uh, repeat any of um, Helen's um, introduction, really, um, but to focus in really on the, the high risk themes that came through across both areas of the service um, and also the medium risk uh, recommendations that came through as well. I'll, I'll walk through those if that's OK with attendees. Um, so the high risk uh, issue that came through from the audit recommendations across both community equipment stores and community alarms was around items of equipment categorised as missing in action. Um, I'm sure this was a standout theme for many who read the audit report. Um, it does highlight a list of uh, 6,000 plus items of equipment recorded as MIA on the system uh, with a value of just over £2 million. 
Um, so obviously we were keen to investigate this immediately and deal with it as a priority. Um, clearly, as uh, you'll appreciate, I'm sure there is an inherent risk with issuing assets out to people's homes um, and also care homes as well. Um, however, the, the undoubtedly there is a um, system improvement that needs to take place to uh, appropriately categorise equipment that's been out in the community. So the list provided um, via the audit actually lists equipment which is, we suspected, up to 12 years old, but it actually goes up as um, far as 20 years old. Um, and that goes some way to um, kind of uh, describe the, the scale of the, of the backlog that we need to clear, really, in terms of the administrative task of cleansing the system. Um, so due to the age of the items as well, I would also urge audit to consider the fact that the value associated with that is based on purchase value at the time of purchase. Um, obviously, uh, pieces of equipment uh, are reduced in value over time. And as Helen described as well, not all equipment is reusable and all equipment certainly has a shelf life as well. So I just like that to be considered as part of the uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, that being said, as I acknowledge, there is definitely system improvements that need to take place within the service to appropriately categorise these items of equipment that are awaiting collection um, and are in the community. So as a service, we're reviewing the, um, the full list at the moment. We will be um, inst uh, instigating a write-off procedure uh, within the service. That will be based upon the, um, the age of the item, the value of the item, um, balanced with the um, cost effectiveness of actually proactively retrieving the item. It's also to be acknowledged as well that with many items that are issued out to the community, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, it's not necessarily a priority of some homeowners to return items for deceased um, family members or people they care for. That is something that we're trying to tackle through better communication with our customers and their carers. So we are um, going into that over the next few months as well. Um, yep, yeah, so we've already started to cleanse the list as it stands. We know that there are some duplicates in the information that we provided to audit. We apologise for that. Um, so we do need to cleanse the list further. And as I said before, there are also a number of items on that list that can be immediately written off due to the age of the item. Um, we are going to be analysing the value in the big ticket items as well. Um, so the, the vast majority of the spend associated with it are actually for those high value items such as mattresses and beds. Um, many of these are within our care homes. Um, so we do need to, as a regional group, uh, consider our procedures around allocating equipment to care homes and their appropriate use. Um, and that's something that we'll be taking forward as a regional group. Um, I am happy to say, though, that when you compare our recent recovery figures and our collection rates and our recycling rates over the last two years, they are vastly improved. So in 2019, a new stock control system called ProCloud was brought into the system. Uh, this enabled us to barcode every single item that we actually issued out, um, and that made uh, stock uh, accountability and tracking far easier for the service. Uh, and we know that actually since, since the installing ProCloud in 2019, there have already been improvements with our collection rates and our recording of those collection rates. And the level of MIA classed on the ProCloud system is greatly reduced when looked at um, based on the historic information that we've received as part of the audit. But um, all of that being said, there are improvements to be made. We will take them forward as a service. And hopefully that will we'll be able to provide a far better picture very soon. Um, I don't know whether you want me to pause there and take any questions, Chair, or? Yes, please. Um, Councillor Mike White, you've got your hand up. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, what I would, uh, obviously reading the report, what I would like to find out if possible, um, Obviously, this has gone back quite a few years, and I say, and I do accept the equipment that you've got to sort of distribute out and working in partnership with Nice Talbot and Health Party. But what what type of record system did you have in place for actually um, uh, for for actually booking in booking in and um, booking out uh, uh, the actual the 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 items that you was 
uh, actually uh, given out to people. Um, what was was it was there any any, any sort of uh, areas of signatures that that, that that you would want you know to show that you've signed it out and we've signed it out so that when they come back in at, at, at least you had some sort of paper trail. <laughs> Don't know whether Helen wants to answer it, but from my understanding, um, the there was a system, an electronic system, stock control system in place before ProCloud. Um, all um, equipment issued is assessed for, um, so that would be recorded on our internal systems. The items themselves prior to 2019 weren't all individually barcoded. Um, items were barcoded if they were over and above a certain value. Other than that, my understanding is that the smaller items of equipment were batch um, coded, uh, which has made tracking them a bit more difficult historically. Um, but since improvements in 2019, every single item of equipment, regardless of value, is barcoded. So we have a far more robust tracking and monitoring system in place since ProCloud has come in, uh, which is an improvement. But in terms of actually tracking what's issued and to who, um, that would be tracked back, I believe, Helen, you can correct me if I'm wrong, with um, the individual that it's actually been assessed for and allocated to. So that would be our tracking and monitoring system that was in place and continues to be in place, actually, but working alongside ProCloud. OK, bye. OK, thank you, Chair. But as I say, you know, you know by when reading the report, it does look, you know, that uh, that there's obviously there it, 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 it was certainly uh, evidence of actual slippage, you know, that it plus mm. one sort of kept, kept closely um, uh, uh, the, the, the areas monitored properly. Well, if I could add another point to that, Chair, if you don't mind, before we bring in um, Julie Davis, um, just, to, just to add, um, what I would say is that I know that in the audit report it did highlight a number of items that were unclassified or without a value attached to them. Which was a which was a concern, um, and I think that was from my understanding of working with the operational manager. Um, that actually is part of us transferring stock information over to the new stock control system. At that point, I think there were some items which, in the absence of better categorization or clearer categorization, were automatically um, categorized under MIA. Now, you know, with hindsight, that was an interesting decision to make. Um, but that may account for some of the kind of uncertain or the undisclosed volumes that are referenced in the audit report as well, if that offers any further clarity, really. Thank you. Um, Julie Davis. Thank you, Chair. Um, hi, both. Uh, include, um, internal audit didn't include safeguarding risk in the scope of the two audits, but they did have a finding around the Lola inspection. So could you give me uh, an assurance as to how safeguarding risk is being managed effectively within the both services, please? OK, in terms of the servicing of equipment and maintenance of equipment, Julie, specifically? Uh, no, not specifically, more generally as well. OK, um, I don't know if I've got a prepared response for that, actually, to be honest. Um, can you, so in terms of the, I know that we've actually closed off, there was a recommendation around the um, maintenance and, and inspection of equipment, certainly in the audit. Um, I know that that is being addressed, that has been closed down as one of our actions. The um, specific examples that were raised as part of the audit um, were closed down and understood to be um, standalone instances um, and there are the right resources in place to actually manage and make sure that our equipment um, ongoing meets all of the regulation needs and the servicing requirements as needed. Um, in terms of general safeguarding across the service, sorry, could I, could I ask for a few more specifics in terms of what, what exactly Yes, um, there was a finding on GDPR training within the yep. audit report, so I wondered whether safeguarding training is also being completed by the staff there and whether relevant staff have DBS checks in place. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Julie. Sorry to ask for that elaboration. Um, yes, I was going to get onto that actually as part of my overview. So with regards to the training requirements of the team, um, yeah, GDPR was highlighted specifically. Um, so with that case in point, um, we are uh, progressing with making sure that all of our staff are compliant with GDPR training. Um, the challenge for us has been a little bit combined with the explanation that um, Helen gave, but uh, really, it's more about um, the uh, frontline staff have, and not office-based staff having access to online training during the pandemic. I think prior to this, a lot of training was delivered face-to-face. Uh, -face. Um, unfortunately, that's been a little bit restricted. However, there are ways and means around this. Obviously, we've tackled this in a number of our service areas, and it's certainly no reason as to why GDPR can't be completed. And likewise, the safeguarding training, Julie, as you rightly point out as well. Um, so we're going through that with the team, making sure that all training records are up to date and making sure that all staff are given the correct tools and access needed to actually complete the online training across all areas of um, st uh, statutory training um, and making sure that's completed. Another part of the um, challenge that we face in community equipment stores and the alarm service is that we do have a number of supported employees in service. Um, which is a fantastic part of the, the service model. Um, it doesn't mean, however, that those uh, staff members have individual needs and individual learning needs, which we're seeking to, to um, meet. So to progress beyond the um, report that you've been provided, we've actually linked in with our colleagues in employee training and um, also um, access to employment services as well. Um, and with a uh, employability mentor, we're actually developing a bespoke training package for those 30 plus members of staff. Um, he's actually made contact with the service. He's due to visit um, down in the next couple of weeks to actually meet those staff, make introductions and understand where their learning needs are and then develop a training package that best suits that. Um, that's going to take a little bit longer to work through, but I think it will be worth it in the long run. And of course, we're establishing those those good links with employee training and access to um, employment as well, which would be great going forward. Thank you. I, I've got a few hands coming up. Before I welcome anyone else in, can I just give for context, I understand the service is run through a Section 33 agreement That's with all the parties, and there is a regional working group that historically, my heart sinks a bit because I'm aware of the, the, the background to the, the store going back many years. And there used to be performance reports produced for that regional partnership meeting to, to show about how the service was being delivered, delivery of equipment, discharge arrangements, etc. Um, so why does it take an internal audit review to highlight there were issues in that store um, and not something that was picked up before through the performance management arrangements? I'm struggling to, to see why the managers at the store and the work of the regional working group, the partnership arrangement, wasn't seen that there were issues around performance, around you know, collection rates, around items missing, because there were quite a rich suite of reports produced for those committees. I don't know whether Helen, this is one for you to answer. Yeah, certainly, I certainly try. Um, so a number of the issues around equipment, particularly equipment that's been issued to care homes over the years, um, were came to the came to the fore about four years ago via that very method, as you say, via the uh, the performance, via us being aware that we were, as you can imagine, in a care home setting, beds, hoists, large pieces of equipment are very very quickly recycled rather than they would be in a domestic home. So there was a piece of work across the region, as you as you describe, around um, developing a protocol for issue of care uh, equipment into care homes, and around developing a um, process for potentially charging care homes for equipment, and and uh, deciding what items of equipment we would provide and what they we would expect them to purchase as part of their care for that individual. That piece of work was worked up. Um, we didn't, we had to develop the infrastructure in the community equipment store in which we would be able to charge the care homes. However, um, I took the piece of work to the externally commissioned care groups in Neath and Swansea to discuss with the care homes. And then I'm afraid COVID hit with the attendant pressures on the care homes. So that piece of work has been um, shelved for the time being. So we are aware and we were aware that we do have 
um, some of the bigger ticket items in care homes. Um, I would say that a number of those items have been out there for significant number of years but there was work underway to try to ad to address particularly that piece of work that had come through the the um the the operational group for the store and the regional partnership okay if, can I, if can I, I, nick, sorry can, can i just ask nick if if we do a follow up of this order can you review the performance management arrangements around the store uh, in conjunction with the, the function and the role of the regional working group. Because I think that's a critical control um, that seems to be missing. Yes, Chair, we can we can certainly uh, build that into the uh, <clears throat> to the follow up review and I'll speak with Simon when when he comes back and um, yeah, we we'll, we'll probably look to to do that follow up review later in the year if if possibly quarter four, maybe quarter one, we'll, we'll, we'll see where we are with the, with the work plan. But yeah, we, we can build those in, yeah, to the scope. Okay, if I can bring um, this hands up now. Councillor Paxton, Hood Williams, thank you for your patience. <coughs> thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I don't know whether I'm straying away from the point at the moment a little bit, but obviously we're talking about community alarm systems here. And my understanding is that community alarm systems are getting far more complex now these days than just a simple, for example, push button to warn <coughs> um, the people who are monitoring these things that a person is in, is in, has a problem. Now, particularly when we're talking about beds and that sort of equipment of that sort of nature, they are, as I understand it, we're beginning to find, well, have beds which were sensed when a person has got out of bed, etc., and that sort of thing. So I'm wondering if we include that equipment in this and are we looking at all in terms of the community alarm systems in terms of the process and then how how effectively it is working in protecting the people that is there to protect. So I, that's moving away from stores and stock and material that's out in the community and hasn't come back etc. But it is obviously a very key part of the service overall. So I don't know if there's any comments on that that anybody wants to come back on. I can comment if you're happy for me to, Helen. Um, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, community alarms, in terms of this, I should, should have mentioned as well. I mean, it isn't just about the equipment. You're quite quite right. Community alarms is obviously an equal part in this. Um, the monitoring and tracking of community alarms is far more straightforward, although the audit did pick up as well that the system also needs to work better for us. And I would emphasise that this is largely an administri administrative issue in terms of our back office processes um, as Helen indicated our delivery and um, adherence to actually meeting our timescales and our recycling rates have actually been maintained and upheld throughout the period in fact they've been at a very high level um, so with community alarms specifically yes you're quite right um, it isn't straightforward community alarms now we link to a number of different parts of assistive technology so things like door sensors uh, pressure pads things like that as well um, so what we are doing is just a general feedback as well as that we're actually going through the digital switch over at the moment for community alarms. Um, so we are investing more and more in what we call smart hubs. So they're more easily accessible and easier to install as well um, and easier to recycle. Um, so they're a, a fantastic boom for us, although it does mean that we do need to upgrade our stock. Um, but yeah, so I don't know if that answers at all, but we're looking to expand and continue to put that at the forefront of our service that we're offering because more and more it is becoming a, um, a key part of um, someone's discharge pathway from hospital in particular or enabling people to remain at home and prevent them going into hospital. So it's absolutely vital. And I'm happy to say that that service continues to operate um, very well and we have continued to provide and it's been key in, in allowing a lot of um, timely discharges from hospital having those smart hubs available ready to go. Okay thank you very much. Councillor Mike Lewis. Uh, thank you Chair. Um, firstly I, I'm not familiar with this section of the service of our service as a council uh, and I don't know who would be in a position to answer this but my question is, you stated that the community equipment stores is a tripartite collaboration between us, NTP and the health board. What are the funding parameters and what portion of this 
is our authority responsible for? I don't know if anybody would be able to give me that information. Thank you. Lucy, I'm sure you can, can you? I can certainly, I'm not sure the exact split. I know that um, in terms of full funding annually, I think our proportion of Swansea Council is around 800,000 per annum, but I wouldn't know, be able to give you the comparative figures for the Health Board and Neathport Talbot off the top of my head, but we can get you that breakdown, no problem. Um, can make that readily available for you. That helps. Thank yes, you. please. That, that's why I mentioned the section 33, Mike. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah was... I, you preempted my question, really. <laughs> but uh, I, I did think on board what you said. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, Councillor Cyril Anderson, please. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Liz, you said in your report that um, MIEs, no matter how um, price, price they are, high or low level, that you you were looking to um, um, for someone to uh, strike out, you know, um, who has got the final decision on striking them them out, and what costs? What's the highest cost they can go to before they can't? They got to fetch him back to us. Okay, uh, well, I think if I've understood correctly, and, and tell me if I haven't. So there's, uh, we are going to have to set those threshold uh, thresholds for being able to write off. I mean, obviously, that's why this issue has come to the fore, um, is that, that there hasn't been a fixed process for writing off equipment. Um, and the balance and what will inform that decision will be a mixture of a number of different factors. Um, I will be taking it to the regional, part, regional board um, for, for a view from our partners as well. Um, but I think that immediately there is a age um, that would automatically override everything else. So the certain age of equipment is simply is not appropriate for reuse, whether, you know, and it wouldn't be uh, economically viable for us to allocate resource to retrieve those pieces of equipment. So straight away, I think the vast majority of the equipment that has been listed within the audit report and is currently on our systems is still active and uh, missing in action, um, we would write off a vast, vast majority of that. As I said, the listed equipment goes back as far as 21 years, which is incredible. Um, so we would immediately look to write off a, a big chunk of that uh, that number straight away, um, simply because we wouldn't be able to reuse the equipment even if we could retrieve it. Um, and then from that point onwards, we'll have a bar to start working from and we'll have a better idea of what we're looking at. I mean, as I said, I do know that actually since uh, over the last uh, two and a half, three years, our total value of um, new equipment, which has been classed, I think, appropriately as MIA, um, albeit that categorisation and the terminology is, is something we are also looking to change because I think that gives the wrong impression of what we're actually talking about. Um, but that uh, level is actually for the last two and a half years is at £155,000. As Helen said, when you're delivering 35,000 pieces of equipment per annum um, and with a spend of around a million pounds per annum on average over the last four years, I think that that would be, you know, I'd see that as fairly reasonable, but that's the debate that we need to take to partners and get a decision on what our threshold would be, what should be our um, our target percentage that we have to write off um, would be acceptable as write off and then we'll take it from there as well but those procedures are still to be firmed up um, we do need I do want to do a full cleansing exercise of the full historic system so that we know what we're working with um, but indications at the moment are that the systems have already improved vastly in the last three years so um, I take that as a real uh, bonus um, and just to answer the point that the chair raised earlier about the re the reporting at regional boards, I would like to just emphasise that there is thorough re performance reporting which we'll happily share with audit. Um, prior, there's no need, you know, if, if that's if that's helpful. Um, so we do have a full um, uh, reporting system that goes in from the pooled fund manager. Um, we meet um, quarterly as a regional group. And the performance indicators do uh, include um, categorization of equipment that's been written off and it does include information on total number of deliveries total number of collections and our recycling rates as well 
Now I can only comment and can only go back so far with that. And again, it's within the period of around three years. Um, but I can say that for last year, our recycling rates were at 85%. Um, and, our, and, and that's based on collections within the same year. Um, so, you know, I do think that there are indicators there already which give us some assurance that the systems have improved and really the bulk of, of the audit recommendation is possibly based on historic. And I'm not saying that that's not absolutely appropriate, um, but we do need to, once that system is cleansed and we do write off where it is appropriate to do so, then I think we'll have a far better indication of the situation in terms of items awaiting collection. Thank you for adding that because I was aware of that richness of, of the performance report going to the Regional Partnership Board and I know there's been some strong discussions around performance historically probably as far back as the 21 years you referred to. Um, so I think it gives it some context but I think from the audit perspective I'd like to see some focus on the performance side because that gives us a, an indication of how we're delivering for our, our, our population, how we're delivering for the patients in most need coming out of hospital. It affects all partners with the delayed discharge of things. So I think the performance side is where the focus of the audit would be helpful to see, because then that should tease out any issues like has been raised. But I think I would agree with you from my knowledge. I think a lot of the um, the items that are missing in action have been missing for many, many years, probably more than 20 years. Um, so I would like to have a, a follow up, Nick, um, and bring in that performance to put some context in it. And why it's also it's important for us as a committee to recognise you were taking on a different role, um, which affected the service of the, the store with the PPE and also a different focus on the emergency situation of COVID abroad. So I think, you know, we have to recognise that. So, um, so you know, it's, it's a difficult read to see such criticism in, in the reports, but I think it needs to be looked at in the context of the uh, service and the way we have to deliver the service through COVID and also the, the history of, of the store itself. But if we can start, Nick, up on the Regional Partnership Board and the performance and how the performance management is rigorously applied, that should give us a level of assurance as we move forward that the store is working effectively. Yes, yeah, that's fine, Chair. I'll, I'll, I'll discuss with Simon um, over the next couple of weeks, yeah. Okay, that's, that's lovely. Um, if there are no further questions, can I thank you both, Helen and Lucy? And good luck, Lucy, in a way that you've not long been in post. So you've got quite a challenge facing you. Um, hang on a sec, before we leave that, I can see Councillor Leslie Walton. Yeah, apologies. I would have come in sooner. I thought um, uh, uh, Lucy was going to go and, and say more about the other uh, risks. Were Did you want to make more comment? And can I come in now and just quickly say what I wanted to say, which was, um, ha having looked first at these things in um, item four, my immediate reaction was two things. One, resources, as in staff, and two, um, systems. And by the looks of it, I'm very pleased to see the action plan seems to have looked in great detail in how to resolve both those two things. So I'm very pleased at that. Um, I might suggest, and you probably thought of this, that uh, when we do ask you to come back, give us some comparison figures. I mean, by the sounds of it, you're already making inroads, but it would be very useful to have some idea of the situation now and the situation in a few months time. So that would be helpful. Is one ever so slightly negative, and you might think I'm being slightly strange here, but I'm not too keen on the phrase MIA missing in action, particularly as we are two days away from the 11th of November. It it it's um doesn't doesn't fit right with me. Can, okay, I, thank can, you. I, respond, can I respond to that, Councillor Watton? I'm afraid the missing in action is um, a phrase that is built into the pro cloud system. It's not it, it's it's part of that system. But we have had conversations on the back of the audit with the company and we are in discussions with them about the appropriateness or otherwise of that phrase. And we are hoping to change it. So absolutely, there's there's 
totally um, resonates with us as well. So we are we are doing what we can, but it, it's um, it's part of the, the makeup of ProCloud, but we are working with them to change that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've not seen any more hands up. So again, thank you, Helen and, and Lucy, for coming to present. And, and no doubt we'll see you back in uh, early 2022. Um, and, you know, fingers crossed we'll see some change. Thank you very much, both. Thank okay, you. We can, we can move on to agenda item six, which is, um, again, for information, the interim audit um, follow-up report. Nick, if you can... Uh, Quickly whiz through that for us. That would be helpful, I think. Uh, yes, Jeff. I suggest I've got the next two uh, items, six and seven. Do you want me to do them both together, as in one after the other? Please, please, please go ahead with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so thanks again. Yeah. So agenda item number six uh, is on page fifty-three of the reports pack. Again, for information only, and it's our recommendation follow-up. Uh, report for standard audits, which committee will be familiar with by now. Um, <clears throat> and it provides information on the status of the recommendations made in those reviews where the follow ups have been undertaken and completed in quarter two. So this basically allows committee to monitor the implementation of recommendations made uh, previously by the team. So if we move, it would be best if we just move straight on to um, page 57 which is the actual table uh, which shows the detail of the the tracking and you can see the uh, the audits where we follow up followed up on the recommendations in appendix one and then appendix two will show that uh, any recommendations that haven't been implemented and the responses that we've received from management uh, in relation to those um, that, have, that have not been implemented. So uh, all the information is in there. It's, it's, it's an information only report, but you can see the reasons for um, not uh, recs not being implemented are, are ranging from, um, you know, pressures to do with with COVID and um, uh, some new software coming in for uh, corporate uh, performance management. So uh, there's nothing really more to say on that agenda item unless there's any uh, questions from anybody on that report. Are there any comments or questions? I'm not seeing any hands up. Can I just mention one just as a comment really, Nick, on page yeah. 89 yeah. with the corporate performance management Yeah. Um, statement really, the the recommendations and the comments there. I think uh, officers need to be minded of the importance of the timeline there um, to enable the um, the council to respond to the new requirements of the bill. Um, I'm meeting with Councillor Holly and Tracy Moretta on Thursday this week just to, to discuss more about that performance management and the role of scrutiny and the role of audit. So it's just a statement really, I don't expect you to respond to that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. So uh, I'll move. Uh, Councillor Paxton. Uh, just, just a quickie, if I may, Madam Chairman, on page 60 in the Leaving Care Act. Um, reference there to the Paris system. Obviously, that's changing. Uh, uh, we're going on to the the new Welsh system. I know David will be very happy about that. David Howes at this point in time. But that's another story, I guess. But hopefully the same me <coughs> mechanisms will be built in that to ensure that uh, <coughs> what, is th what is necessary is done there. Okay. Thank you, Baxter. Um, okay, then agenda item seven. Yeah, okay. So uh, moving on to agenda item seven, again, from information only. Uh, this is our uh, fundamental recommendation tracker report, uh, which provides a summary of the recommendations made following uh, the fundamental audits undertaken in 21, uh, 2021, and basically identifies whether <laughs> the agreed recommendations have actually been implemented. So th this report is on page uh, 62 of the agenda pack. And if we quickly move down to 1.4, as I said, it summarizes the, summarizes the position as at the 30th of September 21. 
Uh, paragraph two lists the the fundamental audits that were undertaken and completed uh, in that uh, financial year. And uh, you'll see on appendix one to this report, it shows the, the, the fundamental audits and the number of recommendations made for each one of those audits. Uh, 2.4 confirms that there were 36 recommendations made and they've been summarised in the table below. So 20 out of the 36, 25 have been implemented, uh, <clears throat> three partly implemented, five not implemented and three were not yet due. So it's a completion rate, uh, ignoring the, the recommendations that were not yet due of 76%. Uh, the remaining eight, if 2.5, the remaining eight recommendations which have been partly or not implemented uh, have been, uh, uh, there's, there's more description with them on, in 2.6. So the three recommendations that have been partly implemented uh, are in relation to accounts receivable. Uh, this is on a yearly cycle, so we will uh, revisit these in quarter four when we carry out the audit again. Um, and then the other five remaining recommendations that have not been implemented. They're all classed as low as low risk and they're related to council tax and accounts payable audits. Uh, further details of these uh, uh, can be found in Appendix 3, which I'll just run through quickly at the end of this uh, report. So the conclusion in at the, the bottom page 64 is that um, <clears throat> the tracker exercise has confirmed that uh, 25 uh, recommendations have been implemented, which is 76%, so it's a, a good result. And if we move down to the appendices, uh, Appendix 1 is the, um, the implementation of the recommendations, which I just discussed above. And then uh, Appendix 2 shows the, the classification of those recommendations, which ones have been partly implemented and which ones haven't been implemented. And Appendix 3 then uh, gives some further description on why uh, the remaining uh, recommendations haven't been implemented. Uh, there's a number due to the, you can see the action taken, uh, and it's it's probably due to the Oracle project. There's a few there, uh, some, some resource issues in some other areas. Um, and I think, uh, I think that's it there, Chair, for that, for that report. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? I mean, we don't jump to the risk anyway. Yeah. Um, so, in the context, I'm not unduly concerned. And the high risk one that's appearing, um, the Governance and Audit Committee have received numerous reports quite regularly regarding debt recovery, etc. So, I think we've had a, a, you know, a fair amount of assurance on work that's been undertaken there. So unless there's no further questions, can I thank you Nick, for attending today and for presenting those reports? And we can move on to agenda item eight, which is Jeff. Yeah. Can I ask you if you can summarise those areas that you wish us to, um, to know particularly? And if you can also include an update on where you are with the proactive uh, group. Yes, yeah, certainly. Over to you. Certainly, thank you, Chair, and uh, again, good afternoon, members, and thank you for your attention and attendance this afternoon. So we're at page uh, 72 in your your pack uh, now. Um, recommendation arising out of this report is that members um, consider the mid-year progress against the uh, corporate fraud function and the fraud plan, um, and note my commentary or our commentary in relation to that. Um, this committee signed off the, the plan back in April of this year and there were eight areas of focus uh, within that plan. Um, this is the first time this is a, a new report that we brought to committee. This is the first mid-year report that the committee has had in the six years that the team has been together and it was felt that it was important to, to give you progress against that uh, plan mid-year and also give you a chance to scrutinise uh, any issues arising from that. Um, most of the commentary you'll find is in the appendix uh, attached, but I'll go through some of the key key points and highlight it. It's a very uh, a summarised report in its instance anyway, uh, Chair. Um, just to reiterate some of the points that uh, Nick has mentioned there, primarily the, the team function continues to, to work remotely. Um, we still are working under some restricted uh, practices. 
that prevent us working uh, fully in some of the areas that we do. Uh, but ostensibly, we're now covering fully all of the, the areas of concern uh, that we would deal with in a, a business as usual uh, process. Um, 2.2, we've used the phrase good. Now, in my experience, there were a couple of options here in terms of us making commentary there. We could say there was no progress, limited progress, good progress, excellent progress or complete. Having uh, adopted that process across all of those eight areas, we are content and confident that the, the progress is good in all of those eight areas. Uh, and hopefully that's, uh, that I can reflect that uh, further in the, in the report. Um, two, three picks up on your question there, um, Chair, about proactive work. Uh, yes, it continues to be a continuing pressure uh, for the team. As you know, we're a team of limited resources. I'll touch on that slightly in a positive vein um, in 2.4 in a moment. But yes, our ability to be proactive continues to be restricted. However, what I am pleased to report to, to committee is that there is a planned proactive piece of work um, coming forth in the new year. Um, I can't say too much about uh, that, uh, Chair, um, in this open forum, because you appreciate it's work that the fraud team plan to un undertake. Um, but what I can, what I can share is that that is in the fin financial uh, revenues uh, sector of the work that we do. And there's a particular piece of work being discussed and developed which should come on stream there. So be quite pleasing to report back to committee um, at year end um, how that piece of proactive work has uh, has gone forward. And it's just pleasing in itself that um, um, some time has been uh, freed up for some proactive work to be undertaken. Um, as, as part of that is, is 2-4. Um, again, this is a, a matter that you've uh, raised continually as this committee and in particular yourself, Chair, uh, and Ben has come back to you and Simon on a number of occasions and supported that. I'm pleased to report that um, the additional staffing resources have now been formally recognised and as I put in the report when it referred to you and a new proposed structure is under consideration. What I can add to that chair now is that that uh, proposed restructure has now been formally submitted to the appropriate channels and that is under due consideration um, and we hope that that is received positively and again we can report back to committee later in the year that we have had an addition, uh, an additional resource uh, put into the team. So that's pleasing that that has come through uh, to fruition. Um, just some very general commentary there, there then, Chair. Um, continue to um, prioritise uh, urgent employee investigations when they come to us. Uh, we're in the midst of some significant pieces of work, employee related at the moment. Uh, again, those will be reported fully towards the end of the, the year. Um, the level of, rep of reported fraud again has increased this year. Um, it's a year on year increase that we're, we're seeing as a, as a trend. We did anticipate a possible drop off that with regards COVID related uh, reports. Um, indeed, those have um, diminished this year as the year has progressed, but have been replaced by uh, reports in other service areas at the moment. We're forecasting at this point possibly a 12% increase in fraud reports again. Um, so it is quite key that hopefully the additional resource comes through uh, through for us and can can meet that increased demand uh, chair. Um, we continue to act as the data hub for the authority and intelligence uh, requests. There's a number of new areas uh, where inquiries are coming from. Uh, we've recently been um, approached by probation service, student loans company. There are a number of people coming to us as the appropriate uh, data and intelligence hub for the inquiries. Um, just to briefly touch on the overview of the activities, uh, interagency work, I mentioned this in the appendix chair, but I'll draw it out here. Um, what is significant there, and I think it was one of the, the factors that the committee did have uh, uh, a mind to, to have some attention to, is our work with the Department of Work and Pensions. Um, I'm pleased to report that the Department of Work and Pension Functions has now started to return to normal and our joint working with our DWP colleagues has recently recommenced. Um, so again, a positive to report to committee. Again, just a small one there under 324, just uh, gives you some indication of the scope that, that, that we cover as a team, um, as well as working with um, the police and the DWP, and in particular the organised crime. There's probably two new areas uh, that we've worked with uh, this year since we reported to you. Um, we've got joint investigation with um, NHS fraud, and immigration enforcement. Um, not a lot to say on COVID-19. Uh, 
what what I can say is that the amount of direct support that has been um, needed by relative departments has significantly diminished um, since April. Not in this, not in, immediately in April when we started the, the new year, probably took until the end of the first quarter for that to reduce considerably. But now as it stands, the level of support is, is greatly reduced and a lot of those functions have returned to, to business as usual uh, protocols. Um, and I touch on there again briefly, um, NFI, and again, that's in appendix one of the report. Um, we've made significant report, uh, uh, significant progress against NFI this year. And at our regular meeting last week, um, we reported that we were probably uh, ahead of where we needed to be in terms of the completion of that exercise. Uh, I think it's uh, foreseen that the, the exercise in its totality would be completed by February next year. That's probably some six months ahead of where we normally are for that exercise. Um, so just briefly, Chair, just to ensure that I've picked up all of the elements there in relation to that on Appendix 1, um, tackle social housing tenancy fraud. I think the significant comment there in the outcomes achieved uh, uh, column is that full investigations have restarted. We're now actually looking at um, some matters that were reported to us during uh, the pandemic and looking at those. Council tax uh, fraud uh, continues to be addressed through uh, discounts and exemptions. Um, that, that's regular daily work, I, I should add. Um, the activity three I've already touched on with regards, pleasing to report that the DWP work has now uh, uh, recommenced. Bear with me, Chair, just looking. NFI, we've already covered in my commentary. commentary. Likewise, internal employees, um, other um, yeah, I mean, we continue to get a huge breadth of allegations, which does lead us into these other service areas that are being being supported and um, raising awareness that speaks for itself, the commentary in there. And again, testament to this committee for raising the profile of fraud across authority. And it's really pleasing to see that that's embodied, embedded now uh, within regularly reported the CMT. Um, there's now, uh, as you were, the risk register now is embedded with the fraud risk as well. Um, and item eight links across with the fraud report that's being produced to you in the uh, the Q2 monitoring report, Chair. Um, that concludes any comments that I have. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Chair. It's a very comprehensive report and pleasing to see some positive moves um, coming forward. Councillor Leslie Bolton, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, First of all, to just say very pleased, and I'm sure most of us, uh, that you're going to be able to do some proactive work, as we've been mentioning this for a long time. So that, that really is great news. Um, something I've, I've probably been curious about for quite some time. I appreciate that as uh, part of um, the council's responsibility to its public, fraud and attention to fraud and tackling is very important. The only downside, I just want you to um, perhaps enlighten me, how do you make sure that who you're um, accusing of fraud, it is fraud rather than uh, inability to pay or forgotten or, or whatever? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, certainly each allegation that is received, and I think this has come up before in terms of some of the language that has been used, um, Councillor Walton, that they are reports of incidents. We have to be extremely mindful that not all reports or allegations are fraud in, in itself. Um, they can be um, they can be malicious allegations, they can be incorrect allegations. But importantly, the point that you mentioned there as well, is yes, there can also be error or misdemeanor in relation to that, and certainly built into our evaluation processes for front end. Um, some of those cases are identified and um, dealt with appropriately. If, however, they do become full investigations and those matters emerge during the investigations, again, in terms of any outcomes or sanctions that are considered, those factors are, are considered within the, within the process of the investigation. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mike White. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Jeff. A very comprehensive report, Federals, and uh, hopefully with, with an additional member on the team, now we can, uh, you know, you, you can uh, help me the burden with you. Um, in regards to uh, employee fraud, Jeff, um, um, about informant form staff, 
Uh, obviously, staff who are on email can easily receive it via email, what the council's position is on how we address fraud. But we've got certain um, sections of the authority which are obviously depot based. Where you've got lots of employees within mainly frontline services and that. I'm just wondering how would how do we get that message over to those members of staff by way uh, by way of informing them that uh, the, the the council stands on on fraud. Yeah, certainly, my I, I think I'll I'll answer that uh, council right with two comments. I have an aspiration, and there's probably an improvement area as well. My aspiration that that would be within existing. Um, communication channels that already exist for all council business, as you said, that falls outside of, of email communications. So issues that are discussed at corporate management team, at departmental management team level, are then fed through those processes. I suppose what it would be appropriate for this section to do is to actually uh, look and see evidence that that is occurring. Um, and, and then we could give you that assurance that those messages are getting through to um, those officers who, who don't have those facilities, Councillor White. That, that's fine, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not seeing any more hands up, so can I thank you, Jeff, for um, presenting that? And I, I'm really pleased for both of you that things have started to move forward in a positive way. And, and good luck for the successes that the new resource will bring as well with the proactive work. Um, we are asked to uh, make a decision on this report. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the decision is we've been asked to make. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, it is a strange one, but it's effectively it's, it's noting the report and considering the mid-year progress. So basically asking if you to raise your virtual hands if you're in favour of accepting the recommendation as written. Are we happy with that? Can we have a raise of hands? So or should we ask if there are any objections, if that's easier? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a majority. That's a majority of hands are showing four. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any against and are, and are there any abstentions? If you could speak out rather than raising your virtual hand. No, there you are. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, uh, the next item on the agenda is another important paper it's for, for information, but significantly important for this committee, and that's the Corporate Risk Overview 21-22. Um, Richard, do you go to take us through this paper? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. So just to briefly introduce the report, it provides an overview of risk during the second quarter, which shows, as is set out in paragraph 2.2, that all the corporate risks were recorded as being reviewed at least once during the quarter. We have six red risks in the corporate risk registers at the end of quarter two, one of which was escalated to the register during the quarter. The corporate risk register as at the end of quarter two is attached as an appendix, which you can see on page 86 in your papers. A guide to the various headings within the report that's included within paragraph 2.3. The report in Appendix A contains all of the corporate risks, which are the most significant and overarching risks affecting the Council as a whole. These are the risks which are identified and overseen collectively by the corporate management team each month. And uh, you'll see that each risk has a member of the corporate management team identified as a responsible officer. I know this report coincides each quarter as well with directors attending the committee to present on their internal control environment, which does include their corporate and their directorate level risks, and that's noted in paragraph 4.1 on page 84. I mentioned at the last committee meeting that, that we'd held a workshop and that we'd developed a video on, on risk control measures, and since then we've been signposting responsible officers to that video, along with a monthly reminder for them to view it and to revise their control measures in line with the guidance that it offers. Uh, after a little bit of a slow start, we are now starting to see some real progress being made on this, and we've started to see evidence of officers actively working to improve their control measures. And we want that to continue, and we want that to, see, to be translated into improvements. And so I hope and I expect that that should be evident in the next report that comes forward to the committee. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Richard. 
um, as I say, very important uh, paper for this committee. Um, I am aware that the Chief Auditor has been doing some initial follow-up work around the, uh, the risk position. And I believe that uh, there's some action being taken as a result of that early work by the CMT to improve the, um, the, the narrative and the attention given to the control measures that would mitigate some of those risks. So I, I'm aware that we, we're still not where we need to be, um, but we're hopeful with the additional focus that the CMT are bringing to bear on the, the risk register um, that we'll start to see much better information contained in these registers at the next presentation. Um, but I'm aware it's a challenge for you, Richard, and thank you very much for the effort you're, you're putting into play. Um, but an important part to support that is the invites that we make in to the, the, the needs of the service individually. And we've got David House with us at the next agenda um, to give us assurance around the way he manages risk uh, governance and internal control. So I don't know if there are any questions specifically for Richard other than to note this paper for information, uh, recognising we've still got some journey to travel um, and engagement from officers across the organisation to make this a real valuable live document and not just a, a feel of a tick in the box. It will drive to the decision making uh, around those risk areas if, it, if it's working as it should work. Um, if there are no more questions, thank you Richard for your efforts as they say um, and we move on um, and invite um, David House I believe to, to give us some reassurance of the work that he's doing across this service uh, area. David, can I welcome you? Yeah, thank and, you. Yeah. And ask you to take us through this report, please. Yeah, will do. Uh, I mean, first of all, the irony isn't lost on me that I'm coming to present on um, uh, assurance and internal control mechanisms. And you've already had an earlier agenda item suggesting that, you know, we've got, we got some significant issues in uh, community equipment store. Um, uh, but never, nevertheless, um, you have a report before you um, that that covers all of the areas that are covered under the senior management assurance um, statements. So I've constructed constructed the report under those headings. If I'm understanding right, you've got a particular interest in uh, risk and how risk is managed. So I'll perhaps um, turn turn to that separately before uh, before making some general comments. I'm not going to go through the the, the report line, line by line, Chair. You wouldn't expect me to. I'm sure um, I'm sure committee members have read it and and already formulated um, questions that they may have. I'll make some general observations though. Um, you know, we've clearly had the the most challenging period in the uh, you know in the history of the delivery of um, health and and social care, and that has tested us in in the extreme over the last eighteen months. And I suppose my my overall judgment would be that actually our, our mechanisms around um, resilience, internal control, the management of risk, etc., have actually stood up pretty well, um, uh, which which I think should give us some overall assurance. Clearly, we still have um, challenges, and clearly things will you know emerge through um, you know through the various assurance mechanisms we have where we will then identify problems and need to um, uh, address problems. But my overall judgment would be actually the, the, the director at the service that uh, has, has stood up you know, really well to the, um, to the challenges at which it's been um, subject. And those challenges have been you know, extreme and nothing that I possibly could have, could have imagined really if, I've, if I go back a couple of years and, and, and was looking forward at that point. Uh, one of the other observations I've made and I've made in the report is we are a highly regulated um, uh, service area in the council. So we're obviously subject to very high levels of both internal and external um, scrutiny through um, inspectors and otherwise, um, you know, a, a internal examples of that include that for a number of years now we have had um, uh, dedicated scrutiny panels um, particularly focused on um, children's services and in and uh, adult services. Um, so, so, you know, a very high level of internal scrutiny. 
it's good to see that the um, you know audit committee have, have, have turned to our area of business as well. And I can see from uh, the minutes of the of your previous meeting, you're referencing that um, cross pollination between audit committee and scrutiny committees, um, and that means that will generate. Um, uh, 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 work and reassurance, you know, reports that are coming before scrutiny are clearly going to be coming here now. And I think you've got another one on the agenda after um, after to today's meeting. Uh, uh, Councillor um, Paxton Hood Williams referenced earlier on um, uh, half tongue in cheek, but actually quite serious about um, the, the shift from Paris to WCCIS. One of our strengths in um, um, in the directorate, particular strength, and well recognised particular strength has been around our um, performance management arrangements, um, but that's clearly reliant on having good information systems at the heart of that. And we have been challenged um, this year as we've moved um, to the all wells um, system. Um, uh, we always knew that that shift of systems would create some challenges for us as we as we move from one system to another and as we needed to get all of our workforce um, familiarised with that system. Actually, some of the challenges we've had have been beyond what we would have um, uh, anticipated. Um, and there have been some particular national performance and stability issues in relation to that um, uh, system, which continue to cause us challenges and mean that at the moment, we are not getting the same level of assurance around uh, performance information and performance management, uh, neither internally or via um, the scrutiny panels, because we can't generate the information um, to the absolute high quality that we've been used to for many years. Um, that's relevant to this conversation in particular, because that is one of the risks that has been escalated recently um, from what would have been a directorate risk. It's now being escalated to a corporate risk. Your appendices attached to the report haven't actually caught up with that. They are they're slightly behind because of the the process of getting things um, um, through to the committee. But I suppose I I offer that as an example of we do follow dynamic risk um, uh, processes where um, each month we make judgments within the directorate about the um, uh, the risks that we um, uh, that we are currently managing and then escalate from that meeting through to CMT. So WCCIS is a very recent example of a risk that has been escalated to a corporate level because of the significant concern that's um, um, prompting for us. So I suppose from, from my perspective, that was a, a nice illustration of those arrangements um, uh, working. Uh, the, the, the other general comment I would make, and you've already touched on it, um, Chair and Richard did in that um, uh, previous item, uh, there has there has been a concern about the uh, uh, quality of the control measures. From my from my perspective, that's not because I don't believe we are um, putting in place quality control measures. I think, from my perspective, the um, the issue is more about the extent to which we are um, using the corporate system to succinctly describe those control measures in a way that you would recognise as being um, smart and in a, uh, in a way that um, uh, Richard and the audit team would recognise as being smart. That is still a bit of a work in progress. I, I had another go at it last week um, and, I, and I am still getting feedback saying still not smart enough. They make perfect sense to me as a director of social services. I know they reflect the work that we are actually doing to um, uh, mitigate and contain risk um, and they are very complex risks that we are trying to mitigate and contain and they're not simple risks where we can say okay do this and then that risk disappears over this period of time. I think it's probably something in the nature of the complex health and care system that we're operating that those multi-dimensional risks require a series of interacting um, uh, uh, approaches to try and mitigate and contain those risks. Um, and to be honest, some of those um, risks are not within the council's you know, control purely as an, an organisation. So we need to, to reference some of that complexity. I, feel, I still think there is work to do about um, coming up with wording and descriptions of those risks um, that make sense to 
you know, audit committee, for example, as well as making sense to the um, director of social services. But we, but we are working on that, and we're working with um, um, uh, you know Richard's team and other colleagues um, to see whether we can find the, um, the 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 right level of description, I suppose, that would ma that makes sense and give that extra um, assurance. I didn't particularly want to pick out other um, issues from the report, Chair. Uh, I, I think I was probably thinking that you um, you you probably already formulated some questions. Um, hopefully from the report that's been um, submitted. So I'll, I'll part there and pick up any specific things. I thought it was a very informative report, very helpful. I, I spotted the, um, the reference to the, um, the new information system. If I could kick off with a, a question. As you mentioned, it was more troublesome than you'd anticipated. How has that been escalated up to um, the, the the people that are involved in the implementation. Yeah, so um, uh, internally, as, I, as I've already described, it is, um, uh, it is at the, high, the highest level of risk and both Cabinet and um, CMT colleagues have been um, involved in those discussions, uh, as have chairs of um, Scrutiny Committee, um, to make sure that we all fully understand the implications. It's an example of something that is not um, uh, completely within the council's control, or huge elements of it aren't within the council's control, because if effectively the um, the um, uh, system that we've commissioned is a Welsh national system, um, uh, and the and the implementation of that Welsh national system is at Welsh government level. So one of the actions we've taken, um, chair. Um, is to write to the um, the um, CIROs that are overseeing that national um, uh, project to put on uh, record the concerns we've had about the challenges around um, performance and stability, and highlighted the particular impacts on Swansea, and the and some of those impacts are particular to us. We're the biggest organisation that's gone on the um, system to date. Um, we're also the most recent organization to implement so we are particularly impacted um, and want the national team um, and Welsh government to be particularly mindful about that around pressing for um, uh, solutions to that and I suppose to mitigate in against any further instability. I am pleased to report that over the last two weeks um, there are emerging signs of greater stability so other organisations are reporting much higher levels of stability um, and they are much more familiar with the system um, that, that I, I suspect we in Swansea are slightly more stable than we can recognise. But part of the challenge for us is that our practitioners aren't familiar with the system and their familiar, the work to familiarise themselves has been undermined and their confidence in using the system has been undermined by the recent instability, which is which kind of makes our position slightly more challenging to make an absolute judgment about. My overall um, view is the system has stabilised nationally and we can get back to where we thought we would be probably three months ago at, um, uh, at this stage. What we also need to do, obviously, Chair, is to put in place um, a whole load of local mitigations around that. And a lot of that has been the implementation of uh, manual systems to track the most important um, uh, performance indicators that we um, that we need to manage on a on a, a, a daily basis, and also manual workarounds around some of our recording. Um, that's fine in terms of that works that works for us and does um, mitigate those problems. It also creates double handling though, so makes, it's going to take us longer to recover um, the position. So it's all adding to that overall concern. I'm pretty confident, Chair, that within about a month we'll have um, uh, de-escalated de that corporate risk down to something that we'll be back managing, managing in the directorate. Did that implementation include training then? You know, I'm saying it was a phased implementation across each organisation and we were, you know, further down the line. But did it include training for our staff? Absolutely, Chair. But again, the um, uh, you can imagine in the context of the pandemic, we had a much greater reliance on 
um, virtual training rather than what we would usually have in these circumstances is a combination of um, virtual training, uh, face to face training, floor walking, you know, uh, mentoring, etc. A lot of that has been undermined by the fact we didn't have um, office space working in the way that we usually would. We factored that into our um, uh, 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 redesigned plan for implementation. We always knew it was going to be a compromise and that it would take us a bit longer. What we didn't factor in was what emerged post implementation, this performance and instability of the national system, which really set us back. So we had a real challenge to implement because of the pandemic um, around the practicalities of that. Um, but then that was you know, compounded tenfold by these, um, this, this recent, un, uh, you know, un, unanticipated national problem. I think the committee can be reassured that you've escalated it up to the Welsh Government and the CIROs particularly. Is, um, I'm also pleased to hear you say you believe it will be stabilised within about a month or so. Uh, Councillor Paxton, what will you answer? You're on mute, Paxton. Sorry, Madam Chairman. Um, I was going to say, obviously, David did say I'd refer to it earlier. I think it was unfortunate in that sense that uh, the system came along, or the pandemic came along with the system, I suppose. It depends which way you get a look at it in that sense, I suppose. But pandemic coming along with it has really made things far more difficult. Um, he's also referenced the fact that there is that tie up now we're getting close all the time between scrutiny and audit committee as well so you know exactly what's going on i think from a, a scrutiny point of view the concern that we have in one sense is that we're not getting the performance data that we would normally have to look at which means that <coughs> we can't be uh, asking the questions that we need to be possibly at various points at various stages however i think both um, <coughs> both committees and I have to say the councillors on this committee who both on, were on either one or either of the uh, scrutiny committees in terms of social services. I think we've got a fair degree of confidence within this, the, <coughs> the way that those other social services and child and family services operate to be reasonably satisfied that um, things are going along reasonably well. Obviously, there are problems that, are that should come out of a system which is not providing information which is needed to say when perhaps um, <coughs> visits need to be made or assessments need to be made and that sort of thing. And that's the main concern I think that we would have. Um, but to be fair, we are getting a fair amount of reassurance within scrutiny panels in that respect that we are now moving to ensure that we have that information coming, even if it is through uh, manual paper systems and uh, <coughs> obviously the problem from that point of view from the so from the department point of view is that as david has said it does mean extra workload we appreciate that and obviously to a certain extent we've ensured that we have minimized the workload as far as the department is concerned that uh, scrutiny would impose on offices as well and that's where we are at the moment i think thank you thank you Patrick. i think it's important for members to take assurance from the work of the um, the scrutiny panels that are, that are meeting and there's also reference to the finance and performance arrangements that are in place. In reading the report I can see the level of control and scrutiny that's been applied uh, and I think you know from a governance and assurance point of view we can take a lot of comfort from, from this paper that you're managing uh, your level of service in, in, a, in a robust way Dave. Um, I, I don't have any further questions. I mean, it's, it's very self-explanatory um, for me. It's just the, the computer when I wanted to probe a little bit more. Um, I'm not seeing any hands up at all. So that gives you some confidence that your report hit the mark for us. <laughs> um, so can I thank you very much? And also thank you for Paxton as well for highlighting the, the role of the scrutiny panels and the scrutiny committee. Uh, in, in the work of, of gaining that assurance for the Governance Committee. Um, it's very interesting, so thank you for attending, Dave. I know your agenda is busy. If you wish to duck out now, you're more than welcome. That, thanks, Chair. I'll just check there aren't anything on the safeguarding report, and then I'll duck out after that. OK, then. Thank you very much indeed. If we can move then on to...
the next agenda item, which is a safe guardian report. And who's taken it? Simon Jones? Yeah, thanks, Chair. It's on page 147 of the uh, pack. Um, and this is a follow up report based on the request at the uh, July meeting of the Governance and Audit Committee uh, that you wanted more information about the governance arrangements within the task groups, particularly uh, uh, within the corporate safeguarding group and how we were managing the improvements required from following well, the Audit Wales work and, uh, and basically the, our, our own work programme. Um, and that, you know, there was um, information around timescales requested. And I guess what we're saying in this report is that it's a work in progress that we are we require month, um, regular progress reporting from each of the leads of the uh, work groups in the main areas, and um, and they provide information to the group, and the group consider the the progress within that context. But we have asked that the uh, leads give more information about timescales where where things are in their control. So this report really is describing more up to date information than you had previously. It's also um, raising awareness that we are on an annual basis reporting quite in quite depth to the scrutiny program committee and that this report that's appended to the, uh, my report is is something that the cabinet member and Dave delivered together to the, the uh, scrutiny program committee a couple of weeks ago when a number of questions were raised on that report and um, and so the uh, the process is quite a dynamic one, really. Um, my report today doesn't cover all the elements of questioning that you had last time in July. There was there's a couple of areas that um, we're not. I'm not in a position to report on at this stage. But by and large, it was re to reassure you that there is governance in place, that progress is being maintained and and challenged appropriately. Um, where we can. So I, I wasn't proposing to go through all the report in detail, but basically just to make those points, really. Thank you. Thank you for this report. Uh, as, as you say, the, the, on, on the page 209, there were the four bullet points that we were looking for for more detail around, which was the action plan updates were being met, um, the potential risk with the school procurement to be addressed, uh, future training provision of school governors was provided, and clarity regarding the terms of reference and the responsibility of the various boards, which you've got clearly uh, attached to that report. Um, and I found the report informative. Um, the only question I had is at paragraph 234 on compliance on mandatory training. What's your percentage of compliance with mandatory training that you refer to? Well, it's the expectation that all staff uh, complete the, uh, the the training as you know that's why it's mandatory in a sense but um, reporting on it has been challenging as I've mentioned before at the last meeting because um, we don't have a system that, that crosses the whole authority that requires you know that where staff are required to en enter their completion of that training at a point in time so um, you know we we work on the um, you know we have worked on uh, various ways of reporting this, and it, you know, it's it, there is at this stage there isn't a system that allows us to do that. Okay, Dave, do you want to add to that? Yeah, no, you're picking chair. You're picking up the same issue we've picked up in the corporate safeguarding group of um, we 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 don't yet have that level of um, sophisticated performance information or sophisticated enough performance information available to us as a whole council. We are expecting that situation to improve as part of the development of Oracle Fusion. Um, and it's probably a good example of how the uh, corporate safeguarding group works or is designed to operate in that Simon's quite right. That doesn't sit within his gift, doesn't actually sit within my gift. What we do as a group is try and hold different bits of the organisation um, to, uh, to account around that these are the improvements we need to make as a um, as a council. This element of corporate safeguarding improvement could be within your gift. It's not always as straightforward as that. And then try and get um, uh, to get those parts of the council to progress it. So at the moment, I'm still holding out hope that the development of Oracle Fusion and then some development work within Oracle Fusion will give us that reporting capability around all mandatory training, 
but I'm particularly interested in the mandatory training around safeguarding. As an interim measure, what we've tried to do is seek assurance from each individual safeguarding lead in each area of the council to manually report to us what is the level of compliance in your area. Um, that gives us some assurance, but I'm probably, you're, you're, I, I, my guess is you're in the same place as me. I don't wholly trust, you know, manual systems and manual feedback around that. Um, but at the moment, I, it, as things stand, on the level of assurance we've, uh, we, you know, we've been given to date, which isn't foolproof, I am confident that we've got a high level of training compliance. It'll never be 100% because you've always got churn of workforce, etc. And you'll always have some challenges in, in some areas, as has been, you know, evidenced, you know, earlier in the discussion about um, community equipment stores. But overall, you know, all the indications are we're up at the sort of 80 percent level at any given time, which is pretty good, given that it was only a couple of years ago that we didn't really have any system for uh, mandatory safeguarding um, training across the council. Just to follow up to the risk associated with the fact that we, we don't know a definitive number or percentage, is that appearing in the risk register? Uh, I, I'm not sure it specifically appears in my risk register, but I'll go, I'll, I'll go back and um, I'll go back and check that. I don't think it is, Chair. If, if the system was operating in the way that I'd hope it was operating, it would sit on the risk register of the part of the council that's delivering the solution around that. So I probably need to go back and do a few inquiries about that, Chair. If it's not, I'll make sure that we pick that up. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking that the dollars training, there's certain training around safeguarding that's you know quite critical. Um, so if we're not sure, I think it should be in the risk register or captured somewhere in the risk register. So we've got transparency about that risk that uh, the council is sitting on. Yeah, I'll go back and I'll go back and check that, Chair. Apologies. Yeah. Councillor Leslie Walton, sorry, uh, sorry to keep you waiting. That's all right. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, Funnily enough, I'm I'm also um, thinking of training, but more um, appropriate training for councillors, because there's going to be quite a lot of new councillors next year coming to the council. And one of the areas that I find um, a difficult concept to actually um, do things, do things in practice about, is the idea that safeguarding is everybody's business totally agree but it's one of those sort of slightly ethereal concepts that it's difficult sometimes to get a handle on and all all I'm suggesting is maybe uh, when bear that in mind when you're doing the training which we probably do but perhaps we all need not just elected but employees volunteers etc a bit of a prod now and again to make us realize what our responsibilities are and how we can actually put that in practice because i think that's a very important concept but as i said earlier i think sometimes it's a slightly woolly idea it's difficult to uh, get a handle on it and i think we need perhaps more help and more advice as to how we can actually be doing our bit thank you I can come back on that chair yeah yeah thanks thanks councillor no i ab absolutely agree with you just for reassurance the one bit that i always do know at, at, all of the time is because because there's a smaller number of you i do know how many of the elected members have had their ma mandatory training because uh, it, it is easier to count manually um, and certainly the responsible cabinet member particularly focuses on that and so as we move into a new administration, again, there'll be a particular focus on making sure um, early early doors of the you know post um, post election um, that all you know any new elected members have definitely had this training. But then I think your wider point around well, even on top of that training, regular opportunities to be prompted around um, responsibilities and examples of how. Um, you know, elected members and others can exercise that everyone's business. I, I think that's a good point, and we will go back to those things do happen. But I think probably some, um, uh, you know, some further thinking by that subgroup responsible for um, overall training and development along the lines that you're describing would be helpful. 
Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, if I can just mention that um, Adam and the Chief Exec and I met some time ago regarding a training programme for the Governance and Audit Committee members. Um, and I think we discussed wider training across other areas where there's elected members and independent members. So Adam, is it possible for you to give us an update, not today, but maybe at, a, at the next meeting, not, not a massive report, but just what, what the current state of, of play is with that work? Uh, because it, it, it is important that we get the training that the elected members and other officers need in all aspects of the council's business, not just safeguarded. Yeah, no problem, Chair. Happy, happy to bring that report back to a, to a future meeting. Thank you. Um, Councillor Paxton Hood Williams. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Just very quickly, obviously the point that uh, Councillor Walton makes about induction training is really crucial and important. I'm sure Adam will take that on board, but not only Adam, I think you've got Hugh sitting opposite you and I'm sure he's picking that point up at this point in time. But it is essential, not just for safeguarding, but also from a corporate parenting point of view, as far as I'm concerned, if I can check that in at this point in time, I think it would be useful as well. Just to remind uh, officers the importance of induction training for councillors in that respect as well. Thank you. I invite you to respond. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, Council last week, 2nd of November, agreed the councillor induction and training programme. Uh, I went at length during the report to remind all councillors that training, the induction and training programme is for new and returning councillors. And I really can't emphasise that enough. People often think it's only for, for new councillors. It isn't. It's for both. Um, safeguarding has been deemed by council last week yet again um, as a compulsory mandatory topic, as have, um, I think there's about... 18 topics and all that have been deemed um, mandatory and obviously um, group leaders will have to work closely with myself and others to ensure that their councillors do attend them. It, I should note as well then, perhaps Dave has been a little coy, 100% of councillors have attended the safeguarded training during this current term of office. Well done. Well done. There we are. There you are, Chairman. I told you that he would have it all in hand, didn't I? Unfortunately, <laughs> I, I had to give my apologies for the last council meeting, so although I'd read the reports, I didn't actually hear exactly what was said as well. So my, my apologies on that score, but certainly I think it's a point that really you can't make too often anyway, so I don't see a problem with that. Thank you. Um, is it Jason Garcia, the hand up? Yes, thanks, Chair. I just wanted to come in on that point, if I could. Uh, you know, obviously, as we're moving forward to the new legislation around your know, audits and governance committees, the new you know, the election will bring in you know, obviously new members to the audit and governance committee as well. If there's anything we at Audit Wales can do to support in relation to your know, ongoing induction, training, understanding about the roles and responsibilities of an audit committee member, you know, please get in touch with us, you know, uh, closer to the time, and I'm sure we will be able to to help. Thank you for that offer. I'm sure we will take you up on that most definitely. So perhaps you get something in the diary quickly before you change your mind. <laughs> we certainly won't change our mind, but just link to that as you as you know individually, this will be my last uh, meet in personally for the council's audit committee. Uh, I move on uh, in December to pastures new. Uh, so you will be having a replacement to myself in uh, the, for the next year's audit. So it'd be something you can pick up with them. Thank you, Jason. Well, being as you've announced that as, as chair of the governance and audit committee, can I thank you very much for all the work and support you've given to this committee over since the time I've certainly been uh, sitting in the chair. Um, it's been invaluable. I know the council officers have had appropriate challenge, but I think you've worked in a fair and, and supportive way with, with officers. And I do wish you every success in your in your future career path. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I don't think there's any more on that safeguarding report unless there are any further hands up. And I thank you both again for presenting both of those papers. I found them very helpful, very informative, and thank you members as well for, for the good questions that were asked during those papers too. Thank you.
If you can move on then to an update um, from Adam on achieving better together. Uh, I'm apolog I'm apologies in advance. I think we've overrun slightly, but I'll try to contain it as much as I can. Adam, over to you. But Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to hand over to, to Marlin, who uh, is, is sort of leading as an officer in, in terms of this project. So uh, Marlin is just going to do a very quick overview of, of the report and then ideally we, we'll just take it to questions because it, it is an update um, just on the, on the programme going. So Marlin, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, all. My name is Marlin Dixon and I am the strategic change program manager for Swansea Council at the moment so I'm going to try and make this a very quick summary and then we can pick up the detail as Adam said um, if you want to go into any questions afterwards. Um, the first point is I just want to be very very clear with the message um, that the main purpose of the Achieving Better Together program is to ensure the council is sustainable, efficient and effective not only in what services we're delivering but how we're delivering services with the citizen at the heart of everything that we do. So since March 2021, we've been in phase two, which is the refocus phase. And although we are still in response um, to recovering from the pandemic, the officers and the work streams have been working really hard and shown some great examples of working together and working in partnership to achieve outcomes, not only for the organisation, for staff, but for the citizens of Swansea as well. Very briefly, some of those outcomes for staff, um, we've relaunched the Leadership Hub. We're um, relaunched the Ideas Hub and promoting um, staff to be coming forward with their ideas for the future for the Council. We've had a renewed Agile policy, which was welcomed. And uh, there's a lot of tools um, and um, equipment being supplied for staff to ensure that they're safe while working from home. For our citizens then, I'm really pleased to report that we managed to roll out across the whole of Swansea, our um, LAC, our um, local area co coordinators um, across the whole of the Swansea region, which is an excellent achievement. Um, another example is education and child and family have got an agreed single point of contact in relation to vulnerable children accessing on-site provision. We've got some great partnership projects going. Um, there's one in the community where we are supplying mobile phones to some of our most vulnerable residents. And there's also a partnership with our education department and DVLA where we're reusing and recycling um, appliances from DVLA out through our schools. Um, the governance structure that has been streamlined because I know that's something that was noted before and you can see that in the diagram in section 5.1 and appendix 2 if you want more detail on that. And then also I'm really pleased to report that we had a recent internal audit examination which was undertaken to further support the programme and it returned with an insurance level of high and no recommendations. So that indicates that there are sound systems of internal control designs to achieve the programme objectives and the controls and um, which are being consistently applied. So although we're not going to become complacent with that result, we are very pleased, but we're going to remain proactive and effective and making sure that we remain outcomes focused um, while we're delivering this programme. So where next, I suppose, is phase three, which is the reshaping phase of the Achieving Better Together programme. But that will be looking beyond 2022 and it will be subject, obviously, to the elections and the priorities of the new council. We're going to be having a new chief exec and obviously a refreshed corporate plan and strategy for the council. So we're going to make absolute sure that this programme reflects all of that and it's it's one complete package, as I suppose, not working in silos um, and away from these other interdependencies. So I'm going to stop there. I don't know, Adam, if you've got anything else to add to that or nope. we'll just well open done, it. Marlin. Okay. Very just... well put together. Chair, over to you if there are any questions. Yeah, thank, thank you for that, Marlin. I mean, as a, as a governance and audit committee, we've asked um, for updates regularly against this programme. Um, and I'm sure you would have read the Governance and Audit Committee annual report to see what the committee's concerns were for the past year or two. And one of the main areas that we've raised time and time again is the service we deliver is based on the workforce we have. And we've not seen workforce strategy and 
we've been assured that there is structural changes afoot. Um, obviously, you mentioned further potential changes for the, the, the new administration in, in, from May onwards. Um, but I just wonder if you've got any indication of when the timeline would be, when, as a committee, we'd likely to see evidence of a workforce strategy. Chair, if I, I can come in on that one. Um, the workforce strategy is, is in um, a, a framework draft currently. It, it is being worked on. Um, rather than uh, just produce a strategy, we're doing it in a co-productive way. So engaging with unions, engaging with staff, going through all the different departments and, and bringing it all together. We needed to wait until the senior management review, uh, which went to council on Thursday, we're now at a consultation, formal consultation period for 30 days until the 7th of December. After that period, we, we will know what the senior management structure is uh, for, for a definite, but that hasn't held anything up but, uh, because that structure is in now subject to that consultation. We can still feed that into the, the programme that's happening. We also need to look at um, so certainly around the well-being strategy, uh, sorry, the uh, well-being assessment that's being undertaken, the corporate plan that will come in next year, because we could end up changing all the workforce and, and looking at a shaping, which is not the criteria that we need for where the authority needs to go as part of the true transformation from May next year. So, so the plan is to develop an overarching um, workforce strategy that, that will be ready around January, February, as we, we previously said it would be. Uh, and then that will roll out from there into more detail once that new transformation program is in place from May next year. Okay. So when would we be able to receive an update on that strategy in 2022? Is that the April time? Um, I, I would suggest that you, you'll definitely be able to get an update in the strategy by February 22 to, to give you, certainly you'd be able to have sight of the framework then or the structures. We've already got the sections that we're working on. So by February, it should be at a point when actually it will mean something throughout all the authority. And then you will also see the direction of travel from May 22 of, of where we're hoping to take it, subject to obviously the election and, and the relevant documents being completed. Excellent. Can we put that in for February as, as uh, an agenda item then? So we've got that in the work programme. Thank you. Right, I've got some hands up. Um, Julie, Julie Davis. Thank you, Chair. Um, hi, Marlin. Looking at Appendix 3 to, to your report, it's, it's quite obvious that there's a tremendous amount of work ongoing within the programme, looking at the different work streams. Um, what assurance can you give me that, uh, that service delivery isn't going to be impacted by these work streams? And also, what change management and stakeholder management is currently ongoing within the programme? Let me, I'll, I'll come in first one and then you, you, you can get into the, the detail if, if need be. So um, certainly there is a massive amount of work going on. And, and I think what the way you need to, to think about this scope is that it's not being done to the organisation. It's being done by the organisation. So each of those work streams are led by a particular head of service or, or a director to make sure that it, it is not damaging the service but enhancing the service in terms of a co-productive approach of how we're going to engage so you've heard from dave all the work that's been happening in social services and how that comes together and that's supported by the other part so so the sum of the parts are a hub and spoke um kind of approach so that it's actually all joined together it's not siloed now it is an actual overarching um in terms of how do we make sure the the governance and change management Again, the internal audit looked at that in terms of the governments are feeding through. So we have the steering group, which will look at the day to day and where the synergies are to make sure that we're not disappearing down a rabbit hole, that we bring that together. That also feeds into the financial aspects of the authority so that we align money and transformation and service delivery. And most importantly, the co-production that comes through that is that we have officers and members through things like the PDC uh, committees. Um, policy development committees also feed into this through the work streams that are happening there so that the change management is an embedded process not a top above process being driven into the services so the services are identifying and we're the glue that keeps it together at that steering group 
overseen a risk level uh, by the, the board to make sure that there is timely uh, progress on all those work streams. Marlin, anything you want to add? No, I think you covered it all very well there, Adam. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I don't see any more hands up, so thank you very much, Adam and, and Marlin, for that update. And look forward to seeing how things are progressing in, in, in 2022. Um, if we can move on then to agenda item 13, impact of corporate insolvency and governance act, Ben. Suburban. Thank you, Chair. Um, given time, I can also, by way of a mere culpa, suggest that this gets wrapped up in terms of the impact into the February report, which is coming back on accounts receivable. It was on the work plan for there to be an update today. And if you had my verbal report, it would have been about some of the implications of both the Corporate Insolvency Act, which is the stuff around support to businesses. But there is also the separate stuff that the committee has expressed an interest in, which is the, the breathing space debt moratoria stuff around individuals the more compassionate part of debt recovery and i think when we first agreed to bring it back into november it was on the basis that we were reporting more frequently back on accounts receivable but you have given permission in the past for accounts receivable to come slightly less frequently given they're working on the oracle implementation so i don't propose to bore members with a a verbal verbatim report through both of those by way of clarification it'd be my intention that i report my officers report on both of them. It's the disruptive effects of the support that was given to businesses, which were both permanent and temporary, and almost all of those temporary arrangements have now lapsed, which will be helpful in terms of seeing the impact in relation to our resumption of debt recovery. But I'm sure you will also want to see something on the, the uh, impact on the sort of personal debt moratorium. Anecdotally, it's been relatively small numbers so far. So that's what I propose by way of verbal update, given the timing, Chair. And I think that's probably a more appropriate use of getting the impact. I will make sure that there's a written annex to the report, which covers what I would have reported verbally today, if you're so content. Thank you. That, that's reasonable, I think, uh, Ben. Thank you for that. And I think uh, combining the two will make it more meaningful for us as well. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, agenda item 14 and 15 are again for information. One is the tracker report and you know that's, that's there for information. The other is the work plan and I've asked you prior to the meeting if um, he could work with, with Jeremy if um, he could get that plan updated because it has been updated since the last meeting um, but we have to to, to acknowledge that Jeremy is not well at the moment and we're sending him our best wishes for a speedy recovery. Um, so unless there are anything more on those two papers, we can have a look at them closer at the next meeting. Um, no. Can I thank everyone then for attending and for everyone's participation as well. And uh, stay safe, take care, and we'll see you in December. Christmas pies. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Bye. Bye, everyone.